Welcome, welcome everyone to another episode. Well, actually, we're here broadcasting live for our Keto Lifestyle crew members. And if you're watching us later, welcome to another episode of Keto Chat Live as well. I am your host, Carol Freeman. And uh, also, I'm here today with a very special guest, Dr. Leslin Keith. Welcome. Thank and, you, Carol. Uh, Thanks for having me here. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. So, so today, we're going to be talking to you uh, about... Your, so your book is a keto solution, the ketogenic solution for lymphatic disorders. I, I forgot to write down the whole name, but I read the yes. whole thing and I got yeah, all kinds exactly. of notes from it. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's good enough. I, I yeah. have a, a, t a secondary title to it that is too long. So th what you said is good. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Well, and, and this is interesting topic, right? Because um, I definitely have some of my ladies that have uh, uh, lipedema. Um, it's a small percentage, but as I was reading your book, I was like, no, everyone needs to know this. So even if you do not have lipedema, you have a lymphatic system and you need to know about what we're going to talk about. So please don't tune out. You need this information. Like mm -hmm. I learned so much and I'm so excited. So, um, so Dr. Keith, can you tell, tell us a little bit more? Um, I wasn't quite sure from reading your book. Are you an internist or, a, um, what type of medicine do you practice? So no, I, and I am, I actually have a doctorate, clinical doctorate in occupational therapy. So okay. I'm an occupational therapist and I specialize in treating lymphatic and fat disorders. Ah. And it includes lipedema, which is a fat disorder, but also lymphedema, um, which is a disorder that you can sometimes get after cancer treatment. You've had lymph nodes removed, you've had radiation therapy, your lymphatic system becomes damaged, and then you can get swelling in the area that you were treated in for your cancer. So th those are probably the two most common um, things that I treat. And I, I really got into keto because more and more of my patients that were coming to me with for lymphedema or lipedema were overweight or obese or even mm. morbidly obese. And it seemed to really make their swelling worse. Mm, and so yeah. I was really trying to figure out a way to um, help them lose weight in a healthy way, because we know there's lots of unhealthy ways out there to lose weight. And then, and, but the ultimate goal was to, to help them manage their lymphatic or fat disorder better. Mm -hmm. um, and so I pursued my doctorate in occupational therapy just so I could run a study. You kind of, you need a, like a university backing, you know, in order to run a, a good study. And so I wanted to specifically see if we adopted a ketogenic diet for people who had a lymphatic or fat disorder, would it make their condition less severe? Would they lose weight? And then would they not have as much of a problem? Mm. And so I did that study. And out of that, I wrote the book that you talked about. Okay. But what is even more interesting is that I was finding out as I was using with my patients and I did the study and everything, I, it, it seemed that it really was independent of weight loss mm. that the lymphatic system seemed to function better. Yeah. But I still you know, work, did my first book that you're talking about because we got 67% of American adults are, you know, suffering from overweight and obesity. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is, you know, keto was just something that was going to help with that pervasive issue. Um, but I, I think that it's even more than that. It seems that keto is actually a fantastic way of eating if you have a lymphatic system, because it makes your lymphatic system healthier. And guess what? Everybody has a lymphatic system. <laughs> spoiler, so, spoiler yes, alert. I know. <laughs> so, so that told me that, that a second book was needed. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm working on and ah. hope to have out this fall. And that one is, um, it's called the lymphatic code because Ooh. we need something that guides us to the, the best lifestyle that we can have so that we have a healthy lymphatic system because mm. it's involved in everything. And let me tell you, the lymphatic system is completely ignored. I mean, have you ever talked about it before? Have you ever even thought about it before? We Doctors don't think about it. it it's an ignored system. And well, I don't know why particularly, but it seems that it's because um, your lymphatic uh, fluid, the lymph fluid is clear, it's mm. invisible. And so it's just not even thought of really. And so, I, but it's so important. So yeah, I thought the same thing. Like I went to school to get 
two degrees in nutrition. And each time I had to take the anatomy and physiology class, like, well, the first time I took it, I was just blown away to even find out that we had a lymphatic system. Um, so let's, let's start there. Let's just talk about like, so let's set the, set the stage. So most of the people watching have no medical background or training. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's, let's, you know, what, what is this magical lymphatic system? Like basics for people. Yeah. And so your lymphatic system is, um, it's that clear fluid that, um, you know, when your, your, um, your heart sends the blood all the way to the tissues and you're nourishing the tissues, it's sending oxygen and nutrients and all this stuff sending out to your tissues. Now, all of that um, now has to be the water and the excess nutrients and the cell debris and, and toxins and various stuff has to be evacuated because you can't leave all this extra fluid in the tissues. And so your lymphatic system evacuates that. And, and what's interesting is that we used to think that uh, most of the fluid got reabsorbed into the venous side. So mm -hmm. your arteries would push it out in the tissues and then get most of it would be reabsorbed in the venous side. And only a, like an inconsequential amount, whatever was left over that couldn't be reabsorbed in the venous side, the lymphatics would pick up. But in 2010, there was uh, some exciting research that was done by Levick and Michelle. They published their paper in 2010 and they said, no, actually 100% of the fluid in the tissues must be evacuated by the lymphatic system. Mm, so mm. you see how now all of a sudden this is really an important system. If you aren't evacuating that stuff, then you get swelling and and uh, all kinds of uh, dysfunction happening in your tissues. Mm. So you have to have it evacuated. And if your lymphatic system is not working so good or you've impacted it by poor diet, mm. then you know we're gonna get illness. The other thing is, so so lymphatic system is, is hugely involved in water balance. Mm. But it is also one of the main components of your of your immune system. Yeah, okay. Right now we're looking at, you know, we have a, a pandemic that's going on and you need to have a robust immune system to help you against any kind of pathogen or anything that's going on with that. So your lymphatic system is what delivers um, the immune cells to the tissues. And it also is going to evacuate the uh, pathogens. And then every time it comes to a lymph node, we know about those in our neck. Mm -hmm. Those become swollen when you have a sore throat or something like that. Every time it goes to a lymph node and you have about 600 of them in your body, in those lymph nodes, we are chopping up, killing uh, all the bad toxins and stuff like that it moves on and it goes to another lymph node, it happens again. And so your immune, your uh, lymphatic system is huge for your immune system. So we need to keep that lymphatic system healthy for that as well. And then something, another important function of the lymphatic system, which really comes into play for a ketogenic diet is your lymphatic system in your gut. That is what's responsible for mobilizing fat. Mm. So you eat fat and it is, mobilized through the lymphatic system from the intestines and brought into the blood. That is, I mean, fat is so important that we have a system just for moving along. So um, your lymphatic system is, is hugely important in your health. And what I have been discovering through self-experimentation, reading all these different research articles, stuff like that, unfortunately most done on mice, but it seems like fat fuels the lymphatics. So when we deny ourselves if eating healthy fats, we are actually impairing the function of our lymphatic system. Mm. And what have we been told to eat for the last 50 years? <laughs> not fat, not fat, not salt, not meat. <laughs> Just eat some grass. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you grow a couple extra stomachs so you can digest yeah, right. that grass, right? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, it, it, you know, in, in summary, I can see we've got some people watching too. So go ahead and give us a comment. So we know you're here and love to have interaction here. So, um, yeah. So in summary, the lymphatic system is responsible for a lot more than you ever thought. It's a mm -hmm. vest system, vestal, vessels and lymph nodes. Um, I thought that maybe one of the reasons it just was kind of ignored was because there's no heart that drives the fluid, right? So oh. they're kind of, oh, and I, yeah. I hadn't thought about it either, but because mm -hmm. the 
fluid is clear that they weren't noticing it so much too. So, yeah. um, so, so that you bring up an interesting point, Carol. Um, as I was writing my my second book, um, the lymphatic code, I'm looking at what's the evolution. How did we end up with a lymphatic system? Mm. Um, and um, it used there are some an, actually animals that still have little lymph hearts, um, little things that help pump it mm. along. Um, How but, adorable! <laughs> yes, they're very very cute. But what we still have, and and humans have probably the most developed lymphatic system of of any um, animal. But we still have in the vessels each um, the major lymphatic vessels between valves. There is actually smooth muscle on the larger mm. vessels that contract. Okay. And so it has this rhythmic pumping these little lymph hearts that, that actually that's what's left over of lymph hearts that yeah. can pump to the next section, the next part of the vessel to move mm -hmm. that fluid along. And guess what? One of the things that, that um, increases that contraction of the lymph vessels is when you eat fat. Oh, interesting. Okay. So How fun. How fun. They, and actually they found, um, and this is again on mice, but high fructose, diet slow down lymph vessel contraction mm. eating fat and they specifically they test this with olive oil mm. when they uh, fed them olive oil increased lymphatic vessel contraction mm. I, I really think that the lymphatic system is fueled on fat and we cannot deny our lymphatic system it's fat well and it's it's interesting the more we study this, the more we find that more parts of our body are actually fueled by fats or our enterocytes, the lining of our intestines are, are fueled by fat as well. So, hmm, we get to just, you know, 50 years of nutrition information, we're just turning it on its head right now. And now we have to tell everybody the opposite of what we told them back in the 80s. So, yeah, and we just need to remember what we used to do, because we used to know how to eat. Yeah. It, we just have to go back to what our grandparents were doing. They used to know how to eat. Yeah. That's, I use that example with a lot of my clients, right? It's like, uh, you know, we don't need snacks, right? Like how many of us grew up being told, no, you can't have a snack. You're going to ruin dinner. Like we didn't need to eat all day long. We weren't allowed to eat all day long. Right. You ate three meals, sometimes you skip breakfast, you were fine, you know, and mm -hmm. often during the summer, I just remember that you, you know, you ate breakfast and then you just played all day long and you're too busy to even, you're like kind of hungry, but you're like, yeah, I want to keep playing. I'll just go home for dinner. So even as kids, we ate like two meals a day usually. So <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I, I wanted to, cause you brought up uh, Alzheimer's um, mm. and there's been actually some fantastic, um, research done on the lymphatic system and uh, brain health because um, we used to think that there was that the brain didn't have a lymphatic system and it mm -hmm. actually is um, we now know that there's actually lymphatics that go to the eye um, there's so we've the only part of the body part that we're thinking now that doesn't have lymphatic system is um, um, is, and now I can't even think of it. Oh, cartilage. Okay. <laughs> okay. The cartilage doesn't have its own lymphatics. Yeah. But for the brain specifically, what happens is that when you sleep, the brain actually shrinks a little bit to allow better space. And then the, the lymphatics of the brain use that time to clear out the toxins, the junk that's collected during the day mm -hmm. that seem to increase your likelihood of, of getting Alzheimer's. So mm -hmm. good sleep means that that brain shrinks, we have more space, the lymphatics clear that out. And so the, uh, they have noticed a very high correlation with people who um, had for um, years prior to their diagnosis of uh, Alzheimer's, they had a sleep disorder. They were mm. not getting good sleep. Mm. So you have to have that nice deep sleep for a certain amount of time every night so that, that your brain can get cleaned up by your lymphatic system. Wow. So. I just love the more we study and know about the body, the more everything is connected, right? Like mm -hmm. when I was in school, they were just starting to understand that 
uh, you know, previous it was vitamin D was just needed for bone mineralization. And then mm -hmm. when I was in school, it was like, oh, wait a minute. It turns out almost every cell in the body has a vitamin D receptor on it. So it does more than we thought. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now it's being recognized for its role in uh, our immune system, but right. you know, it's, yes. it's needed for every, everything. So s side note of the vitamin D too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and Dr. Keithers, uh, this is another little fun fact about my family. Totally. I just wanted to share this with you because I was reading your book about all the different, um, you know, lymph disorders. So my, my cousin, he was born, he was born about six weeks premature uh, and he ended up having both lymph angioma and heme angioma. And as a little baby and kid, he had so many surgeries. So basically the lymph angioma for people that don't know are, was just an overgrowth. He had so many lymph nodes that were growing in his neck area that it was like clogging off. He couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. And so he, he had to have all those like excessive ones removed. And they at the same time was developing heme angioma, which basically was the overgrowth of blood vessels. And yes. They, they grew so many in his neck and his tongue that he had to have a tongue reduction, reduction surgery because it also was just um, clogging it. And, and uh, apparently, I don't remember which one of those, but having both of those is so rare and they don't have a very good prognosis. He's now in his 30s and uh, actually, I think wow. he's, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I think he's almost 40 now. So he's, mm -hmm. he's doing great and it's a miracle he's alive and hasn't had any flare-ups in a long time, but used to mm -hmm. have some really big problems with that as a, as a child. So I will, I'm excited to let him know that for the health of his uh, limps, he needs more fat too. So yes. Yeah. And, but he's got to cut those carbs because one thing mm. that I'm seeing through just reading through the literature is that carbohydrates are inflammatory to the lymphatic system actually okay. cause more water retention, um, slow down the lymph vessel uh, contraction. So they can't transport um, extra fluid that you have in your tissues by eating carbs. So mm -hmm. you got to eliminate those carbs and then give your, your lymphatic system that nice fuel of good healthy fats to help keep it um, uh, healthy. Interestingly, an, another um, condition that you can get, another lymphatic condition is uh, um, chylocystitis and uh, chylothorax. And it, it is, um, so that's your, your gut lymphatics that transport the fat. And they, if there is an injury to it, if you're born with the malformation of those, you're gonna get this, just the huge buildup of uh, lymph uh, in your abdominal cavity. And typically um, because MCTs seem to avoid, they don't travel through the lymphatic system, they say, okay, well, let's not burden these intestinal lymphatics by we're not going to, we're only going to eat MCT fats and no other fats. And then they, they won't have as much to carry. And so and this is only done on a, a single case study. But what happened on this person is that they went on an MCT only diet. And all of a sudden, when they tested the, the lymphatics, uh, the contents of his lymph fluid in the intestinal lymphatics, it was full of MCT oil. Mm. It was full of uh, medium chain triglyceride fats because it needed, my, my, I surmise, it needed fat. And if mm. you're not giving it any other fat, it said, okay, we'll take the one we usually don't use and we'll put that in there. Normally, the MCTs bypass the lymphatics. They just go straight to the liver via the portal vein. That's why it's a really fast energy type of fat. Mm. But the lymphatic said, we need something. We need some kind of fat. And so it co-opted a fat that it normally doesn't use. Mm. So give your fat, your, your lymphatic system, the fat that it needs. And it needs, uh, usually is going to just have um, th those long chain um, uh, triglycerides that are going to be carried through the lymphatics. And so feed your lymphatics. Give it fat. Mm. Give it what it wants. Give it what yes. it wants. <laughs> um, okay, excellent. So let's talk now about this um, lymphedema, which I know, you know, um, I don't know if you have a sense of like the prevalence of that, but I can guess that it's probably just been getting worse over the last 50 years that we've been starving our uh, lymphatic system of the proper types of fat. So can you share a little bit more about like, um, you know, so, what it is, how somebody knows yeah. they have that. And right, right. So lymphedema is when your lymphatic system is either impaired from birth. So 
So, you know, like your cousin had a lymphatic system impairment. Um, so it's impaired from birth or it, it has suffered some kind of injury during your mm -hmm. life. And the most common injury that it gets, because those, the lymphatic uh, impairments from birth are very, very rare. So the ones that you most commonly get of an injury to the lymphatic system is ca cancer treatment. Mm. And so you have lymph nodes removed. Um, and so for instance, if you have breast cancer and you had the lymph nodes under your arm removed, because that's where the cancer usually goes from the breast, and then they radiate that breast area and under your arm um, so that further damages the lymphatic system, then it has difficulty evacuating that amount of fluid the normal amount of fluid from the region. And so you have very regional lymphatics. So the, the lymph nodes under the arm would just serve the that half of the trunk, that breast front and back, you know, that area of the trunk front and back and that arm. And so typically a woman who had uh, breast cancer treatment, she would get swelling either in her breast unless she had a mastectomy and or her arm. And so that might be something you commonly see. And mm. so any cancer you have, for instance, if you had prostate cancer and they removed nodes in the lower trunk, you, your legs could swell because that's the nodes that take care of the fluid coming out of the legs. Mm. It depends where you were treated and then that part of your body can swell. Um, and also in um, tropical and subtropical regions, there is a problem with a, a parasite, a filioretic parasite that invades the lymphatic system and um, gives you repeated infections and causes scar tissue and, and then they don't have proper access to healthcare. And so you see these, um, what is called elephantiasis, so gargantuan mm -hmm. limbs um, in those areas. We just don't see that so much in the US, but really in tropical regions of the world, you will see a lot of people who are, are suffering from that condition but now quickly becoming the much more common reason for impairment to your lymphatic system is obesity. Mm. So I was seeing more and more people coming to my clinic that just because they were obese, their lymphatic system was um, becoming impaired and not able to evacuate the, the lymphatic load to the lower body. And so they would start first by getting some foot and ankle swelling, and then it gradually would work up higher and higher in their body. And so I would, they would come in, they would have treatment, which involves some massage, some compression bandaging, um, some exercises to help pump the fluid out. But we can only do so much mm -hmm. because if they still are overburdened by their weight, by their obesity, by their poor diet, that was also affecting the lymphatic system, then you can only achieve so much with getting, trying to get that fluid out and try to stay ahead of it. So, um, so, I think now the biggest problem is obesity and, and that's what the lymphatic uh, lymphatic therapists are seeing in their clinics. I would ask them, you know, go to a conference. What percentage of your patients do you think are, are there because they are obese, that they have swelling in their legs because they are obese? And I was hearing numbers of 80% mm -hmm. of all their patients. It wasn't because of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because they, you know, had a genetic, disturbance and, and were born with lymphedema, it was because of they were obese. Hmm. So that's, you know, really what spurred me is that, that we have to do something about this. We have to be able to help people help themselves to take care of so they don't need me. You know, I'd be happy to do something else. I don't need to treat lymphedema. <laughs> you know, if, there's, if there's no one out there that has the problem, I, I would rather the people didn't need me, right? Hmm. You could do other occupational therapy things. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so let's um, then let's compare that to lipedema. So the words are very similar for people listening. So one is lymphedema as a f sound in it. And yeah. then the other one's just lipedema, which yes. um, if you're seeing the words, basically the first part of the lymph one is about the lymph system. And then the lipedema is about the lipid system, which uh, it, you know, in the, um, whatever the science world, instead of saying fats, we call it l lipids. So right. that's where the right. lipidema is a, is a, um, an issue with the fat system in the body. So right. tell us about lipidema. Yeah. And that, that's a good point you bring out Carol, because this, it is there. Um, what we're seeing is that the lymphedema is a problem with the lymphatics 
that also can develop problems with fat because mm -hmm. in a uh, swollen arm, you know, from breast cancer treatment, the longer it you have that stagnant fluid in there, it actually causes fat to proliferate. And mm -hmm. so she will not be have any other fat in the rest of her body, but she will have a lot of fat in her arm. Lipedema, on the other hand, is a fat disorder that ends up having a problem with the lymphatics mm. because of all the excess of fat. And so what happens in lipedema is that it is a, a curious distribution of fat from the waist to the ankles, where you would, if you see a woman with lipedema, she looks like she has two different bodies. Mm. She has, you know, a, a, a normal size, often a normal size body from the waist up. And then you have sometimes a very huge shelf at the, the hips and going down to the ankles and then little tiny feet. A lot of times the feet are not affected. Sometimes the upper arms can be affected. And so mm -hmm. you would see, um, you know, this normal shaped body in the, on the trunk, but the upper arms are very, very large. And then that large lower body. And so, but it's not just this maldistribution of fat it's it's pathologic fat because mm. it is very very painful for a lot of women with lipedema that uh, just on um, very light touch they're hypersensitive and it's very very painful they bruise very easily sometimes mm. they have no idea that they don't even remember any trauma and a bruise shows up in that area in the lower body that's affected by lipedema um, uh, it's uh, there's they have all these things that go along with that maldistribution because it's not if you just have uh, a pear shaped obesity that is not necessarily lipedema mm. um, you, when you have this the fat pathology along with it then that's when we start um, diagnosing it as lipedema and it originally um, diagnosed that that it, there was such a lymphatic involvement that at the end of the day, there would be all this water retention and then overnight it would go down. And so it seemed like you had a, you know, you'd have four or five pound weight change during the course of the mm. day. So they felt that there was an edema portion to it. Um, it, it the more we study, it, we're not sure is that edema or that swelling portion, is it because now the lymphatics have been damaged and they're actually getting lymphedema on top of the lipedema? or is that part of the syndrome that we're, we're, we don't know for sure. But one problem with that, that women with lipedema have is one, they don't even know about it. Mm. They don't know that this is a condition. They think they just have obesity. But um, the other thing is the doctors don't know about it. And mm. so if they happen to find out about it, as you did, Carol, when you met uh, Catherine Sale, um, they'll go to their doctor and say, hey, I think I have lipedema. And the doctor says, that's never heard of that. That's, that's nothing. And so, um, but what these women have found is that they will go on a strict calorie restricted, low fat diet, you know, eating 500 calories a day, and they'll become emaciated in their trunk and will, nothing will happen to their lower mm -hmm. body. The same thing happens when they go, when they have bariatric surgery, they'll have a, a gastric bypass and they will lose weight only on the upper body and mm. nothing happens to the lower body. So, and, and they feel like, okay, I've just got bad genes and um, I don't have good willpower. I just, you know, this is my lot in life, but really it is not their fault. We think we're theorizing now that this way we've been eating for 50 years of high carb, low fat exacerbates lipedema. Mm. And so, um, so yes, you probably have bad genes and or uh, there's hormonal involvement. And then you put on top of that a high carb diet, mm. then it, it really um, exacerbates and, and um, a lot of uh, women um, end up living a, a miserable life with a lot of pain uh, mm. uh, and, and ever increasing size of their lower body and a lot of social embarrassment and they feel um, judged and people are blaming them for for um, their lifestyle they brought that on themselves and it and it, it's not their fault hmm. yeah and especially if they've tried all these diets and their body's only like nope we're only gonna let you lose the weight where you don't need to lose 
the weight or where you don't want to lose any more weight. So, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah. And I, I ran into, and maybe you know her as well. So Jillian Zolos. Um, yes. Okay. So I met uh, her and, you know, keto conferences yes. years ago, became good friends with her. And um, so she'd shared with me, I remember overhearing what her talk about, or she would share with me that how she lost the most, the higher fat intake she would she would consume. And at that time it was kind of a curiosity. Um, and after reading your book, it's like, Oh, it, it's kind of making more sense. Right. Because, uh, because this, this fat distribution error, um, mm. is so entwined with the lymphatic system. And if the, the lymphatic system isn't working correctly, isn't healthy, the tissues aren't healthy because they aren't getting the fat they need, then, the well, and you, you have to talk about this a little bit more about how integrated those are, right? When one part's unhealthy, they put more fat there to help fuel the mm -hmm. lymphatic system. So it's this, mm -hmm. this never ending snowball effect of that. And it sounds like this, you know, not only keto, but perhaps an even higher fat keto than maybe a lot of people can do well with, mm -hmm. um, maybe optimal for, um, our, uh, our people with, you know, lymphedema and or lipedema. Um, but so before we go there about like more about what um, kind of dietary invention interventions you found work really well, like, so can you kind of share more about then how is it that the lymphatic system and uh, the health of one affects the other, the, uh, the lipid yeah. system? Yeah, that's, that's excellent, excellent point, Carol. Because um, another reason why I believe the lymphatic system is fueled on fat is that question of, uh, you know, a woman has breast cancer related lymphedema, she has her arms really swollen, it's been sitting there a long time, and now she all, it's accumulated, but it's mostly fat, it's not so much fluid, but there's a lot of fat in that arm. And so what uh, some researchers in Australia found out, Natasha Harvey and others, was that, that there is lipolysis with an acute infection. So we break down fat, when we have an acute um, situation. We have an infection, we break down fat, I believe, because it's fueling the lymphatic system, which is our immune system, to help us fight that infection. But when we have chronic inflammation, as lymphedema is, we chronically have this buildup of fluid in the arm, and so it's chronically inflamed. The, I believe the lymphatic system is saying, hey, I, ha I have a long-term thing I'm going to have to battle. I need mm -hmm. fuel let's put fat here so mm. that I have the energy to battle that long-term situation. And we gradually get more and more fat built up in that area. Mm. Um, Natasha Harvey and others in um, Australia found that, you know, when we look at um, historically at um, where the lymph nodes beds are in our body, typically they're lying in a bed of fat. Mm. So mm. when you, when your doctor goes in to remove lymph nodes under your arm, he has to dig around in there to find the ones that are lit up with the blue dye this for the sentinel biopsy. They're finding the ones that are the cancer it could be draining into. And so it's digging around in that fat pad to pull out that, that uh, lymph node that we need to remove. And so Natasha and others uh, surmised that it's lying in that fat pad because that's the fuel for it. That's the fuel that it needs. And in, again, on animal studies, what they did was they, um, when they would take uh, an animal that was not obese and they would excise the fat that was around those lymph nodes. And then they would also just, if they, if, uh, they had some excess fat elsewhere on their body and their belly or whatever, they would excise that fat. Well, guess what? They, the, the fat that grew back the fastest was the fat around the lymph nodes. Mm. The body said, hey, we need that fat there. We, we don't have to have the fat elsewhere. But mm. if, if those two sites were removed, it would grow first mm. back around the lymph nodes to make sure that it had that fuel. So mm. now you look at, at lipedema, and there is some um, theory that actually women with lipedema prehistorically those were the women that um, were able to survive famine and reproduce and be able to care for their young because they were able to store fat in a metabolically 
safe place. It wasn't around their belly. These women with lipedema have a very narrow waist typically. If, they're, if they don't also have obesity, that waist can be very narrow. They were sit, storing it around their hips and butt and, and thighs. And so that was a, a safe place to store fat. So in the time of famine, they had fuel. They could have breast milk and, you know, they could, they could re, re, uh, reproduce and care for their young. Um, so then the problem happened when, you know, that uh, woman now is living in modern times and we are told to eat low fat, high carb, that distribution of, of a way of storing fat, which was an advantage evolutionarily, now becomes pathological because it's becoming so excessive mm. that it, it becomes pathological. And then you get the pain and the bruising and, and the edema and everything that goes along with it. And your body says, whoa, this is a, a style of storing fat that's gonna keep this body alive. So if, if you go on a starvation, I'm gonna keep that body there. If I eat only 500 calories a day of low fat, I'm gonna keep that body on the lower body. And so um, we think that women actually with lipedema may have um, insulin resistant fat tissue, not necessarily be insulin resistant or diabetic systemically. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, okay, yes. so, so it might be just that they're they just the just the adipose tissue is insulin resistant because mm -hmm. this was mm -hmm. you know this was an advantage, and the body does sees no reason to let go of that fat unless that person is going to be near death from starvation. Oh, okay, now we'll we'll use it, but otherwise let's save it because we might be in a long term famine here, and so let's save this here. So um, it's, I mean, this is something we just don't know. This is a theory that we're looking at that we would like to test clinically and why we think that a ketogenic diet, maybe one reason why a ketogenic diet works for someone with lipedema, that they actually start losing that lower body fat because when you feed your body fat, it's telling your body life is good, food is plentiful, I can let some of the stored fat go because there's there's no famine going on here. Mm. Um, so it, it's very, very interesting. I think we're gonna learn more um, the more we try this out. And people like Jillian have been experimenting with it and sharing her story um, that she lost an incredible amount of lower body mm -hmm. fat because of she went keto and she actually did a, a interesting carnivore experience mm. uh, experiment with um, Dave Feldman um, those two worked on it together for her to do specifically um, a certain ratio of, uh, of protein and fat and um, carnivore. And it was for a short period of time, but it really showed us that maybe for women with lipedema, we have to get that insulin so low mm. in order to allow this lower body fat to be released so and I would just say, say to your viewers that if you may not know for sure that you have lipedema, but if you are, if you have lower body fat and you have been doing keto very strictly and you're at a standstill, try going carnivore and just having protein and fat and see if you get some movement again. And it's not like you have to eat that way the rest of your life, but, you know, 30 days of carnivore and then regular keto and then several months later, do another 30 days of carnivore. And that may be what you need. Mm. Well, I, I'm so excited that you brought up that like insulin resistant fat tissue down there. Cause I actually had a, a, a theory about that just helping, you know, the clients that I have been doing. So my six year anniversary of keto is coming up in about, you know, let's say about a week, a week. Uh, uh, I don't know when you're watching this in the future, but at the time of this recording is about a week away. And, you know, for about five and a half years, I've been helping a lot of different women with this. And I've seen that, though, that um, there are some people um, that at the very beginning of starting a keto diet, that they'll have more swelling on their lower legs. And some of them do have lipedema already, and some of them don't. And I've, uh, I've, I've seen this pattern, and basically what I've had, you know, to help them through that time, because it's always been kind of a temporary thing, is that, um, you know, encouraging them to look up, you know, if they can go get at the time, they could go and leave the house and get uh, lymphatic massage 
or sharing videos with them about how to do that for themselves. Um, you know, perhaps we, you know, we do the reverse wall sit where you put your legs up there and, you know, just kind of helping them with getting that fluid back. And I had a sense that it was because their lymphatic system just wasn't healthy enough to start this new fat transport that it had to do that had been starved of for so long. It just wasn't quite healthy enough um, to get all that fluid to come back. And so it was a temporary thing. And the other thing was also making sure that they're having regular bowel movements because nothing backs up your fluid issue more than not having regular bowel movements. So that was all the things that I had to work with. And then also um, I found that for my, um, you know, I'm really big on optimizing salt intake for um, my ladies as well. And yes. I found that th those, that same group tended to be a little more salt sensitive as well, whereas everyone else needs a lot. And then that's where I thought like, oh, so what if, so um, they still need the salt, except for that that area of their body is more insulin resistant. And so it's actually, while the rest of it's flushing the fluid out because there the insulin is still too high to flush the fluid out, it's holding on to more of the salt. So you're kind of confirming like just the patterns and theories that I had um, thought was going on. And so, you know, I'm like so, excited that they do like maybe tissue samples to check the insulin levels in the fat or something or. And, and you know what, and there was an interesting study done out of, I believe it was Vanderbilt in, in Tennessee. And they were looking at women with lipedema and they were looking at the sodium content in mm. their, uh, in the lipedema fat. And they did find that women with lipedema had a higher level of, of sodium content compared to uh, normal controls or women who had simply had obesity and did not have uh, lipedema. And so there is that higher sodium content. Now, what is the reason and what is that sodium doing? That's what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the authors of the study said, we are in no way saying that women should cut down their um, sodium intake because of this. Um, because it actually might be, I mean, your body doesn't do things just to screw things up, right? It's right. trying to figure out how mm -hmm. to be healthy. And one thing that, that sodium, especially in that subcutaneous tissue, it's used to fight infection. And mm. so are women with lipedema, is it an inflammatory condition? Mm. And is there, is your body drawing sodium to that area because it, it's, being used to, to fight an inflammation. Well, now mm -hmm. we have sodium in the area and is it causing a retention of fluid? Um, there's always a secondary thing that mm -hmm. happens due, due to the, you know, the primary thing you're trying to fix, but now it's something secondary happens. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I don't, do not believe that, that you need to, just because you have lipedema or even lymphedema, you should not be decreasing um, your, your sodium intake, especially if you are going keto, because we know we lose a lot of, of sodium and, and the dangers of low sodium are way worse than the dangers of high sodium. Yes. Yeah, so I do not recommend my patients, if they are doing keto, you actually need to add salt to your diet. And this is very hard for a lot of people. It's, it's, it's hard for them to add fat as it is to add salt. They yeah. They're afraid of it. Well, and I find it's, it's I think it's, uh, it's so interesting because every day I'm having salt coaching, you know, with my clients, right? And thankfully there's this book so I can recommend the salt fix book yes. to every single person and it's yes. not even a keto book so I can help at least allay their fears, right? Because yeah, yeah. That's another yeah. one of those things. I, that I got my copy too. Yeah, here we are. Here it <laughs> is. Book twins, yay. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Oh, and so I can allay their fears a little bit, but it's just, it's, it's actually sad that we've been conditioned to fear salt, right? So I use the analogy of like, and they're really hesitant when I'm like, you're constipated, we need to add more salt. They're like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, mm -hmm. but if I told you, you needed more calcium, you'd be like, oh, how many pills a day should I take? Mm -hmm. And if I said more is good, yeah, let me get some more. Like nobody's afraid of getting too much calcium, but salt, we've been trained that that's a dangerous thing. And I said, they're things our body needs. They're both just minerals. And unfortunately, one of them has been demonized and we're afraid of it. And the other one's been glorified. And, and I, I don't know if we could prove which one was more important, but mm -hmm. I kind of think salt's more important mostly because everybody's under eating it. But yeah, well, and, and it seems to be that we need a lot more salt than we need of calcium. Calcium is more and more one of those trace yeah. minerals. And yeah. It's definitely essential but we don't need as much as we need of salt. I mean, I, I try to have, you know, at least a teaspoon a day. Um, and um, 
I think this is, I mean, you have to tell me your tricks on how you get people over that fear. Yeah. But a lot of times <laughs> what I tell people is that, hey, if you're feeling, you know, super fatigued, so tired, can't even lift your arms, um, kind of have a headache, um, irritable, take a little bit of salt, maybe just a half teaspoon, put it in some water, stir it up and drink it down. And then 15 minutes, if you don't feel better, then that wasn't the issue. But you probably will feel better in 15 minutes. Now, of course, this is always done with your your physicians. OK, mm -hmm. um, you know, because we do have people that have uh, salt sensitivities and stuff like that. So I, I definitely do not want to go outside of, you know, their recommendations by their their doctor. So um, but this is something that they can discuss with their physician. And if that is is OK with their physician, this is a very easy fix. Yeah, yeah, I do. And it, yeah, just like Dr. Keith said, uh, check with your doctor, make sure you're working with your qualified healthcare professional on your optimal salt amount. Um, what I do for my clients is we kind of have quizzes on our coaching calls when somebody's having an issue. I find that the number one sign though that they're not getting enough is constipation. Oh, and so when they get the salt right, then they don't have constipation issues. And so that's the number one, you know, headaches, muscle cramps are kind of the, typically those are going to be like the most, uh, like, yeah, that's probably not enough salt if you're having those, but also, yeah, cravings, fatigue, um, ex excessive appetite, um, lightheaded dizziness. Um, there's another one recently too, now that I'm just like, what was the other one that recently we were like, oh yeah, and that one too. Um, it'll, it'll come to me in a little bit. But um, so, we, you know, everybody kind of figures out their own way. So what I do with my clients is they start with a minimum of one teaspoon extra per day on top of what's in their food. And then we increase from there based on symptoms only. Um, and, you know, thankfully there's, there's more information coming out recently. Um, it's in your book and Dr. Um, uh, Finney mentions it as well. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, we look at people's salt intake uh, historically, pe not keto, but just people in general that are consuming between four to six grams of salt a day are the healthiest to have the lowest mm -hmm. cardiovascular issues. And so, um, so I dose, you know, I typically have people do a half a teaspoon per dose because that's about how much bowel tolerance is for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, if they take it with food, they can do a lot more. So they typically can do like one whole teaspoon, um, which is about almost about two grams of sodium per meal uh, with their meals. And so I we brainstorm different ways, you know, so it's like put it literally in a little shot glass and take it that way or put it in a taller glass with a squeeze of lime or lemon. Usually that tastes a lot better. Um, heat up the water, use with bone broth. So warm bone broth, you can put a lot more salt in there and people really like that. Um, other ones my clients have figured out is that if you put it with a little bit of sparkling water like LaCroix. Now it's gonna fizz like crazy when you first pour it in, so do it really slowly. Uh, but they like that as well, um, just the citric acid or the acid in there complements that again with a little lime or lemon wedge. Um, I had one client that she found that she liked to take half of a tomato. So she kind of saved all of her carbs for her evening meal. She would do half a, uh, half a tomato and put an entire teaspoon of salt on that and eat it like wow. that. Yeah, that yeah. was her way, you know? So um, Element, the, the um, salt supplement that's out on the market now is also really popular. I don't know if you're familiar with that, with that the uh, drinklmnt.com, the little oh, okay. individual salt packets they have a bunch of different flavors that are really delicious they put a little bit of citric acid in with the salt and then most of them have a little bit of stevia and then some other flavor in them so they're like the best tasting uh gatorade that doesn't have any corn syrup in it mm -hmm. um, out there and they're individual little packets each packet has one gram of salt mm -hmm. um so that's another one that most people really really enjoy and won't fight you on so it's a for me it's a combination of just kind of allaying their fears that like it's, it's not bad. I know that you think we've been trained to fear it, but it's not. Yeah. The other thing that I'll tell them as well, and um, so I know in your book you talked about how the, the body's greatest store of sodium is in the lymph system, which I was didn't know. That was fascinating. Okay. Um, the other thing that I'll say, and, I, and now I want to fact check this because I always told them that our backup storage of salt is in our bones because all of our minerals are in our bones. Sure. And you know, what I learned in school is that in order to keep our blood balance of all of our electrolytes, we're constantly breaking down bone and remineralizing it. Right. And the problem with breaking down bone to get salt is you can't just pick the salt out and leave all the other minerals. And this is actually my personal theory of why we have such an epidemic of 
um, partially, so it's uh, of osteoporosis, is the yes. combination of low fat eating and low salt makes yes. our bones just get picked to death over our life and not yes. get remineralized. Yes. So we need fat soluble vitamins in order to mineralize our, our bones and we need enough salt uh, to get that in there. And so what I will do is I'll paint the pictures like, okay, you can, you know, maybe it's annoying you're having a headache and you can't go number two. Those are annoyances. But if I explain how, if you're not gonna eat enough salt, guess what your body's gonna do? It's gonna go pick out the salt out of your bones and you're gonna just like, lead yourself to osteoporosis then they go i don't want that like that's a scary thing to them whereas having a headache and not pooping is just an annoyance <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's one of the other things that i'll do as far as like to just get them on board with like you know this is a serious long-term thing if you're not willing to consume enough salt for your body to be healthy um right. so that will often get them to go okay 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 this is serious i'll i'll yes. I'll, I'll increase it so <laughs> yes and and how does that work into the whole you know, the, the, the good thing that we're looking for, the, the better imaging for heart disease is the calcium artery, uh, the coronary artery calcium score. Yeah. And so, and then there is some question about, you know, are we drawing calcium out of our bones and is it getting deposited in the heart where it's causing harm because your body is trying to fix some other deficiency? Yeah. And so would, you know, um, like you're saying, if, if we were to eat more salt, can we um, decrease that problem of calcium getting um, deposited in those coronary arteries? And, and that's way out of my, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, area of expertise. But, uh, you know, like you were saying that the, everything works together and we're, we can't just deal with one little part of our body it has permutations mm -hmm. to everything else it's yeah. going to affect everything else uh, that's what makes it so interesting yeah it's so true it's like even though we don't just because we don't understand why the body's doing that doesn't mean that there's a really good reason for it doing that right exactly yeah yep. so can we talk more let me look at my notes to make sure because i had so many things i wrote down about your book um and okay we talked about that um yeah. Oh, oh. And then, so in your book, you're talking about too, about, so the excessive fat can lead to elevated, um, C reactive protein, which, uh, promotes inflammation in general, which then promotes more fat. So it's this vicious cycle here. Um, and it also suppresses anti-inflammatory agents. And so I found, mm -hmm. um, you know, for me personally, just going keto within the first two weeks, uh, and I don't know how much of my backstory, you know, but I was in a really bad car accident and my inflammation that my naturopath checked at that point was like over seven. And within mm -hmm. two weeks, it dropped down to two something. And, you know, wow. it was a 60 or 70% decline in, in just mm -hmm. two weeks. Right. So I know that just keto in general helps bring that down. Yeah. Um, do you have a sense then of, you know, for some of your ladies with the chronic lipedema, they may may have an elevated um, C-reactive protein longer than maybe somebody who doesn't? Is that what you're seeing? Or So, uh, so I will say two things about that. One, you were talking about, you know, when we have excessive adipose tissue, um, we suppress some of the anti-inflammatory agents like adiponectin. Mm. Adiponectin is, you know, really suppresses inflammation. I mean, sometimes we need inflammation as part of healing. So we have to have this balance of inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory agents. But when you're suppressing the anti-inflammatory agents, the infl inflammation wins and it becomes not just acute, it becomes chronic, which that's mm -hmm. when it's bad. It also happens that adiponectin, and this is a uh, anti-inflammatory hormone that's emitted by fat tissue. When we have too much fat, we, we suppress that and adiponectin increases the healthiness of the lymphatic system. It actually is used mm -hmm. to make um, the, the vessel walls. And so if you have leaky lymphatic vessels, you're leaking the fluid out and it's not transporting it. So we need, we need to have less adipose tissue so we have this healthy anti-inflammatory agent that is, is helping with all kinds of stuff, um, including the lymphatic vessel health. And then um, what we're seeing with women with lipedema, yes, I do believe that they have probably, I start out with an increased CRP, but we are seeing with women with lipedema, when they go keto and not just part way, but full on to keto within two weeks, their pain diminishes mm -hmm. drastically. They could be having a level of eight or nine or 10 out of 10 pain 
And then when they go with less than two weeks before they've even had any fat loss, because that's what we've said is that, oh, it's just because of the excess of fat and that's why they have all this pain. And so when they lose the weight, they won't have as much pain. Right. Before they've had any fat loss, the pain goes down to one or two out of 10. Um, yes. We just had a, a, our ketogenic solution for lymphatic and fat disorders uh, symposium was held on April 17th um, virtually. And we had a woman, Teresa, who she has lipedema and she has obesity. And she was presenting about using a ketogenic diet. She tried every other diet and never got any help, but she thought, okay, I'm going to try this one. She would roll out of bed and take, you know, a whole bunch of Tylenol every morning. And it was a trial, a, a great deal of pain. One morning she woke up, rolled out of bed, stood up, started doing her day and didn't take any Tylenol. I go, wait, something's wrong here. Am I actually awake? This was six days of doing keto and her pain was gone. Yeah. Six days. So there is something hugely anti-inflammatory about mm -hmm. this way of eating, getting out the carbs and eating healthy fat. And this is the kind of changes that you can make. It is healthy for, I can't think of any part of our body it's not healthy for. <laughs> so um, I would really urge your listeners to consider that if they're not already doing it. And, and if you are even on the plant-based spectrum of keto, um, consider adding more animal sources because plants have carbs. Mm. Can't get around it. We love them. But they <laughs> have them. And so moving more and, and eating, putting more animal source foods in your diet um, will be even better for you for every part of your body. Mm. Uh, Dr. Keith, Keith, have you ever um, worked with somebody with uh, CRPS, the chronic regional pain syndrome? Uh, and I have, uh, but uh, my experience with that is prior to mm. um, doing uh, keto myself and with my patients, but I got to think that it would help with that. So if, if your listeners don't know, but um, chronic uh, regional pain syndrome, um, CRPS, and it kind of does crap. This is- Or well, CRIPS is the other thing that people don't like that it, the acronym is too, yeah. Is it's like your nervous system has gone wacko. It is, you've had some kind of injury and um, in, um, slammed your finger in the car door or something like that. And it was very painful when it happened and, and the tissue was damaged and now the tissue is healed, but the, the wires are still saying that severe pain, severe pain. I mean, it, it is usually have swelling with it um, and it, it is quite a, a, a horrible condition. And I really got to think that that is probably a lot of it is caused from that chronic inflammation that is that won't go away. And I would love to see a research study on doing that. Yes, have you done it? Not a research study, but I'm a, a case study. So yeah. um, after that car accident, so I had two, two ants that developed it. One has since passed and another one's still living. Um, so I was familiar with what it was. And so after that car, ac that car accident that I was in, my legs were smashed up against the dash and knees to ankles just completely like nearly crush injuries to my legs. And so as I, I was developing it, I didn't want to, I didn't want that to be what was happening because I know how disabling it is. My, you know, the aunt that's still living has had, you know, a, a spinal stimulator implanted in her back to numb her from the waist down is how bad it was. And um, so I didn't want it to be what was developing, but the signs were all there and you're right. It is, you know, the pain scale is the worst pain the human can experience and the pain from the original site just begins to spread. So it started, you know, my legs was starting to spread up, up my legs. Um, the, the sensitivity, the hypersensitivity, like just a brush on the leg is excruciatingly painful and the swelling as well was, you know, I couldn't stand or even sit with my legs down. It was just, I was going to a pain specialist and um, basically, the, all they do is refer you to a pain management therapy group because they don't have anything they can do. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I started keto and the pain went away. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I call it the pain is in remission, right? Um, the swelling, the pain, the hypersensitivity, like every, all the symptoms. You added, of it. you added the carbs back. 
it would come back. It, yeah. So if I push my luck with carbs, I can feel like the legs get tight, like the skin gets tight and just a little more sensitive type of thing. That's like, it's still there. It wants to yes. come back. Yes. And, um, so I went into my pain doc and I was so excited because I just thought, oh, he's going to just want to know everything possible about this and we're going to change the world. And he was big on the plant-based diets and the oh, veganism. Yes. And um, he, I, I'm, you know, oh, what, what'd you do? And I said, well, you know, I, I, I called it low carb, right? Because you don't want to freak him out by saying keto. And oh, well, that probably, that probably isn't anything to do with it. And I said, so, well what now? And he goes, well, well, you don't have any pain anymore. What do you want me to do for you? And, uh, and I said, well, aren't you interested to know what I did? Like, this is remarkable. He goes, oh, well, you probably just didn't even have CRP as thin because that doesn't reverse. Oh, it's chronic. Oh, and I was like, well, what did I have then? If, you know, I had all of the symptoms of it, like they're, they're very distinctive symptoms that nothing else causes that. And so then he says, well, you must have just had a CRPS like syndrome. Like he just made up a term. He made up well, a new syndrome. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, they have, they're so set in their paradigm that they mm -hmm. have got to make whatever you say fit into that paradigm. Yeah, yeah. So, but I do believe that um, the more people that experience that and they go to that doctor, it'll eventually, he will start to see, you can't unsee what you're seeing. And yeah. so um, I did I have so. a patient who uh, participated in my study um, with, she had lymphedema, she had obesity, she actually had undiagnosed lipedema and she um, was doing keto, her doctor was vegetarian. Mm. So, um, but he did sign off on her participating in the study. She did all this stuff, her, her pain went to zero. She had all this increased energy. The, the size of her legs went down, her weight down, down, her percent body fat went down. And she went back to him and said, you know, um, looks like this is working. <laughs> and, and at first, I mean, very, very resistant, but he had to come around because he said, well, wait a minute, let's check your cholesterol, right? Let's, There's let's gotta be your, your coronary uh, artery calcium score. Let's do what's the one you test in the carotid, the carotid artery? Yeah, uh, the so, because he was sure this high fat uh, animal food mm -hmm. diet would be killing you, right? So he did all those tests. I mean, she had a, she's in her seventies and she had a coronary artery um, calcium score of zero. Mm. She did, you know, the triglycerides were low, the HDL was high. I mean, everything came out perfect. So eventually he said, okay, I, I guess you can continue with that. Yeah. And so, and then I, I had several more patients who were doing that and he would sign off on their plan of care. So it, eventually they, if they see it more and more and they see the evidence that actually this person is showing all the signs of health that they will be convinced, but it is, it is a, it's a challenge. <laughs> De it, it definitely is. And I only hope that he sees more. Um, the, the, the problem with people with that kind of chronic, um, pain though is that they're on disability like they can't work like I was at the point of like can't work and yeah. I was getting my food at a food bank and I, this is in the in the fall and winter time this is why I'm passionate about like supporting local food banks for high protein foods because mm -hmm. it's extremely difficult like I started this when you know I could go to the food bank and get an entire basket full of baked goods for free yeah. And then when I switched to keto, I had to resist all of that mm -hmm. <laughs> and go out with like, you know, maybe a third of my basket full of like the proper foods. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it, it, it is a big challenge because the doctors think it doesn't do anything different. Diet doesn't change anything. Anyways, yes. we've totally got on a tangent I here, know, but I'm so passionate about but helping. There is, you know, CRPS does have that swelling component. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and, and I imagine not only do your pain go away, but the swelling went away. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, let's see. I'm going to look at my notes for your book. Um, mm -hmm. I think that covers all the things there. So what, what, anything else that you want our viewers to know about the connection? Oh, oh, no, no, no. There was one other one I wanted to ask about too okay. then. So as far as like uh, implementing implementation of a keto diet with people specifically with, you know, lower body swelling, which, you know, we'll, we'll say is very likely probably due to not as optimally healthy lymphatic system. Like that's a, this is where everybody can, uh, 
get on board here. But even, you know, lipedema and lymphedema, um, do, pe do they do better with a much higher version of fat on, than keto some other people? Is, is that something you've seen or is it, it vary from person to person or? So I think, and this is just um, my opinion, but it just as working with people in this um, uh, for over the last 10 years or so, um, that it actually has to do with your metabolic health. Mm. And so, um, so for instance, I had a patient who um, was uh, not obese, but she had a swollen leg because of her ovarian cancer treatment, mm. but she was very, very physically active. She cycled, she swam, she hiked, she did all this stuff. Um, and so she decided to go keto and it, um, she did not, she actually did not go keto. She just went low carb. Okay. And she lost fat in her leg um, and, and the swelling was easier to manage. And mm -hmm. she lost maybe, I don't know, five to eight pounds, mm -hmm. but mostly she lost fat in her leg and it just made that easier to manage. But she was not metabolically deranged. And so now if you have abdominal obesity, you probably have, well, if you have abdominal obesity and high triglycerides and uh, hypertension, you know, that cluster of things that say you mm -hmm. have metabolic syndrome, you may need actually lower carb than the other person. And so mm -hmm. just by um, going low carb, you probably will have a beneficial effect on your lymphatics. But to really achieve really good health and good lymphatic health, you might have to go even lower. Um, mm -hmm. And, and really get your insulin levels really low. And so, um, and that's the person that I really encourage them to try to get more animal source of foods in their diet than, than and not have so many of the plant sources. And uh, in, in trying to, and this, you probably do this with a lot of your clients, Carol, is figuring out, you know, just because the food is keto, maybe it's not good for you. Mm. So maybe you don't do so good with nightshades. Mm maybe your inflammation and your swelling increases when you have nightshades, which are eggplant and, you know, peppers and stuff like that, which uh, usually on low carb and, and sometimes even on a ketogenic diet, those foods are fine, but maybe not for you or cruciferous vegetables, maybe the broccoli and cauliflower are inflammatory for you. So how, you know, experimenting and figuring out that what it is. So it, I do think it is very individual, but the main thing is, are you metabolically healthy or do you have some metabolic damage? And then that kind of de determines how strict or how low you need to go with your carb intake. Mm. Okay. So not so much varying percentage of fat intake or total fat more just yeah. lowering carbs more. Okay. And, and for, you know, this, we're learning more and more about the fat intake because when we first started doing this with women with lipedema, that we were kind of going off of what they did for epilepsy mm -hmm. and it was very, very high fat intake. Yeah. Um, but what some people like Dr. Eric Westman and others were doing when in the obesity field is that they were finding that let's let the, body fat be the fat part of our diet and might maybe not eat so much mm. fat. And so, you know, 80 to 80 percent of the women with lipedema also have obesity. Mm -hmm. And so we started modifying that recommendation saying, you know, just eat fat to satiation, mm -hmm. but you don't have to say 80 percent of your calories are going to be fat. Maybe for you, you don't need that much fat because now we can also work on the obesity at the same time that we're working on the lipedema. Mm. Um, but if you have someone like Jillian, who I would not say she's obese, she has just lipedema fat on her lower body. Maybe she doesn't need 80% of her calories to be fat. Mm. It, it's, it's a, a very complex question that I mm. think we don't know for sure exactly how to, to answer yet. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Anything else uh, you were hoping I would ask about or anything else that you feel like you'd like our uh, viewers to know? Um, I would just say that, you know, it, it takes a lot of self-experimentation and, you know, figuring out um, what is going to be, what, how do you feel the healthiest um, and how does your body respond to various foods? 
I would say that there's probably very, 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 very few people that um, that need to have carbs. So, so if you decide to go zero carb, that is probably going to be fine. And, and all of the rest of it is negotiation. How <laughs> much can I tolerate? You know, because I really like X plant mm -hmm. food um, that has carbs. Can I do that and still feel good, still be healthy? And so, um, uh, so again, with the consultation with your healthcare provider, um, making sure because I don't know what can, medical conditions you have and, and things that you're working with. And so we need to make sure that this is safe for you. But there are very, very few people that need carbs. There are no essential carbs. Mm -hmm. So it is not bad to eliminate them all as long as you're doing this with your healthcare provider. And then seeing what your body can tolerate if you really, really want to have some of those carbs. Yeah, and the other, you mentioned the nightshades, cruciferous, oxalates is the other one. Oh, that you huge one. Issues too. I yeah. no longer, yeah. I mean, I cut out almonds a long time ago because I was I was doing a whole bunch with almond flour mm. and got a kidney stone. Oh. Okay, so, you know, it only took one for me to say, I don't want to ever have an almond again. <laughs> so. Too much of those keto baked goods and it gives me like a, a stomach ache. So I think that's also what's hap happening yeah. for me too. So I, I minimize that too. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here, uh, Dr. Keith. How can people get in touch if they want to know more about uh, your work, your support? So um, you can contact me with uh, two email addresses um, that you can use, either Leslin Keith OT for occupational therapist at gmail.com. Or um, if you specifically have questions about lipedema and you want help with that, you can get me at Leslin at lipedemaproject.org um, and you know check out our website at, at lipedemaproject.org as well as my website leslinkeith.com tons of information in both of those locations and I I'm always happy to I mean I could talk about this stuff all day so feel free to email me uh, I, I always love to um, talk with people and, and uh, share information Oh, that's great. And we're going to link all of that in the show notes down below as well, too. So thank you so much for being here, everyone. Give her a round of applause for being here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to share. And um, thanks for helping getting the word out about how do we get this population healthy that we've we've got to turn this ship around 180 degrees from where we've been. So thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you, Carol. And thank you for everything you do, too. <laughs>